Hello, good evening and welcome to uh, episode 14 of my Notcast. At the moment I've been doing these one a day um, as a result of being off work and having the ability and time to do so. Um, you all notice something a little bit different today. I look like a beefcake, more correctly, I think I'm wearing about nine t-shirts in one go. There is a reason for this which will become apparent as we go along. Um, today we're going to talk about the solo works of Pink Floyd, starting in around 1969, all the way through up to 2019. It's 50 years, I'm not going to do it in 50 minutes, so it's going to be a two-parter today. And uh, first and foremost, um, if you've got any comments, suggestions, any questions, any subjects that you'd like to hear me ramble on about in front of my mobile phone, um, do put a comment down there. So we're going to start off with uh, 1970, well, when, or more correctly actually, probably around about 1969. So in 1968, Sid Barrett left the band. Uh, reason being is that Sid um, wasn't really able to function cohesively as, as a performing member of the band anymore uh, due to a, a combination of factors, including, but not limited to, drugs. Anyway, as we, we kind of go along, um, the first thing that happened on the solo front from Pink Floyd uh, was, the, was the release of uh, a solo album by Sid Barrett, which considering that Sid had left the group uh, because he couldn't perform um, and had difficulty writing songs, uh, was, was pretty strange, but uh, there we are. So the first album that was released was The Madcap Laughs by Sid Barrett. Um, which has, uh, which was produced by David Gilmore and Roger Waters. I think David Gilmore also plays on this. Um, it's a strange record. Um, very clearly, you know, the, the the lineage from the first Pink Floyd album, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, and bits of Source Full of Secrets, are carrying on in here. So there's that strange uh, approach to melody. There's that unusual approach to language and construction and syntax uh, as i said previously uh, a lot of the songs on this kind of almost sounded like they'd been written by an ai version of a sid barrett um because they were similar but they, they kind of like were quite far removed from from where you would think as a standard human things like chord progressions and time signatures and stuff like that uh, would go on uh, it's got a couple of great songs on it um it's got terrapin it's got golden hair um it's got, you know, I think, 13, 13 tracks on it. It's, it's the sound a little bit of a man kind of sort of maybe possibly starting to unravel a little. So you kind of got the impression when you listen to it um, that his grasp upon the conventional reality that everyone else lived in um, wasn't quite there, that he was you know, very definitely engaging the world entirely and solely on his own terms, um, which is you know, to be applauded. Um, this CD edition um, I will come back to later on. Uh, there was a second solo album, which is called Barrett, um, which is, again, 12 songs. Uh, this one's produced by, by David Gilmore and, and Rick Wright, who perform on the album. Um, so it's almost Pink Floyd in some respects. Um, it's got a number of great songs on it. It's got Dominoes. Um, it's got Love Song. Uh, it's got uh, the fabulously titled Effervescing Elephant. Uh, again, it's it's the sound of, of Sid kind of moving away from a conventional form of reality that most of us live in. Uh, perhaps one of the strangest and most unusual things about this particular record is that it includes in it um, abandoned takes, fluffs, out, um, you know, outtakes, bits where he abandons the song and starts again, uh, almost to kind of give you an, an insight into how difficult making the album might have been, um, possibly a deliberate choice. Uh, by David and Rick in the producer's chair to kind of show that uh, look at what we're dealing with here, guys. This is this is not straightforward. Uh, although Sid, of course, wasn't wasn't above saying from time to time the odd thing that uh, or acting in a certain way that made people think that perhaps he wasn't, you know, playing with a, a full deck or perhaps far more cognizant of um, what he was doing than perhaps you might have originally have thought. I bought this one in two thousand and three. Uh, according to the receipt on here, 4th of October 2003 for £20 from Music and Video Exchange, which was next door to Nostalgia on Comics in Birmingham. And uh, what we, we also later find is that a, a few years later, in 1974, the, the two existent, existant Sid Barrett albums were released as a double set, also coinciding with a nice pair uh, by Pink Floyd. Uh, so you've got uh, The Madcap Laughs, 
and Barrett on a double album, um, which is available secondhand for less than the actual originals might cost if you bought a standard new repressing. Um, that's obviously not the end of, of, of the Sid Barrett story. Um, Sid recorded some radio sessions, which were released in 2004 and 1990. This CD here is the, the, the version from 2004 that features eight songs. Uh, it features five, uh, which were recorded in 1969, I think. And then another t three, Baby Lemonade, Dominoes and Love Song, that were recorded, I think, in 1970. Uh, no, they're all recorded in 1970. Well, songs one to five were recorded in February 1970, and songs uh, six to eight in 1971. Um, this has a, a song which you can't get anywhere else, which is called Two of a Kind, allegedly written by Rick Wright, um, but Rick never confirmed or denied that rumour. Um, the last three tracks on this were taken from a cassette that was recorded by a fan from the original radio broadcast, um, the quality is pretty shocking, but at least we've got them. And that's the, those are the only uh, Sid Barrett live recordings that exist. It, I think he only played two live shows uh, in, in terms of his solo career. Uh, following on from that, 1970 saw the release of the aforementioned The Body by uh, Roger Waters and Ron Keaton, um, which was effectively half a solo album by Roger and half a solo album by Ron for the soundtrack for a documentary that went through and detailed how a human body works. Um, as I've said before, it's not particularly great. They're on geese in tracks. I have no relation to anything that you might like if you like Pink Floyd, but it is worth a listen. It went a little quiet on, on the solo front for a number of years at that point. Um, Sid Barrett made an appearance during the recording of Shine On You Crazy Diamond for the Wish You Were Here album, uh, but he just showed up at the studio He's not but audible on, on the finished song, uh, and he looked very, very different indeed uh, from how he did then. So the, the next kind of thing that, that came out, actually, was in 1978, May 1978. We have the first solo album by David Gilmour. Um, and it, it features, by the way, a lot of, kind of like younger childhood photographs. So these are the three musicians that were on the album. Um, they're also members of, uh, I think, David's first pre-Pink Floyd band. Um, it's got nine songs on it. Guest vocals, I think, by, by Roy Harper, I think, is on one of them. No, let me have a look. No, he isn't. No, complete lie. Um, although, yeah, Short and Sweet was written by by David and, and uh, Roy Harper. Um, it's got a couple of covers on uh, a couple of songs that he played when he was in his first pre-Pink Floyd band when they were doing cover versions uh, but it's also got I think eight or nine uh, David Gilmore originals uh, and you can clearly see that it's the sound of Pink Floyd's guitarist but not in a Pink Floyd context so you can very clearly hear when you listen to the solo albums the bits that came from Pink Floyd or the bits that came from the other members of Pink Floyd um, it's good not amazing um it probably would have foretold a reasonably successful solo career by this esteemed british guitarist uh, but he probably wouldn't have got any further in terms of um, commercial prospects than gary moore or rory gallagher or maybe thin lizzie um sounds a little bitchy it isn't really um it, it genuinely it isn't now in 2006 there was a, a cd edition of the album which features some slightly longer mixes of the songs. Um, some of the mixes were shortened for the original vinyl release so they could fit on two sides of a vinyl disc. It was made a little bit longer. Now that came out in May 1978 and in September 1978 uh, brought us the first solo album by uh, Rick Wright. Uh, this is the staggeringly titled Wet Dream. Uh, if you can kind of see or perhaps view out a little bit on here. Uh, the cover is, is actually a sunbathing woman alongside uh, a small model boat. Um, now this was, it sounds Pink Floyd-ish. Uh, it, it features uh, Snowy White from the Pink Floyd live band on guitar. Um, and it features, I think, uh, you know, mo most of 
it was it was recorded actually at the same studio that David Gilmore recorded his first solo album on. Um, and he, you know, Rick sings vocals on a number of the songs here. Uh, there's some unusual kind of uh, destinations sonically that perhaps you wouldn't necessarily fully expect. It's not an album I come back to often uh, on the grounds that it's suspiciously close to yacht rock. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing if you are particularly in the mood. Uh, it's pretty hard to get on CD, or at least it was until a couple of years ago. This is a 1993 US edition. At one point, this CD I think sold for about £100 because it was the only CD edition of the album that was available. Um, it's probably best if you listen to it uh, on Spotify uh, and, and find out if you like it. Um, I'm not uh, a huge fan of it. Um, but again, there's some songs in there that could have turned into Pink Floyd songs and some songs on there that had Roger had perhaps a slightly different view might even have become uh, Pink Floyd songs. Um, and the same with, with the David Gilmore album. There's a couple of songs on there. Short and Sweet, for example, has a chord progression that's very similar to Comfortably Numb. Um, again, these are songs which could have become Pink Floyd songs had Roger Waters um, been, I think, more open to the prospect of collaboration. So when Roger was saying that members of the band weren't writing the songs, what he meant was they weren't writing songs that he liked. And that's perhaps where, where things perhaps were starting to change in the band. Now, in... Um, 1981 the first nick mason solo album was released this is called nick mason's fictitious sports and uh if i'm honest it is a solo album by uh i think carla blay and um all rick does on it really is play drums and I th as i understand it uh his comment at the time was i wanted this record to be recorded no one could afford to do it until I promised to play drums on it and then badge it as a Nick Mason solo album. Um, it's, I think I've heard once, and uh, it's it's okay at best. It's not my wheelhouse at all, not the type of genre that I like to listen to. Uh, what it's, it's reminiscent of early parts of Pink Floyd. Uh, there's a song, I'm a Mineralist, uh, that has so many time signatures. It looks like an autograph book, and uh, it's, it's a very strange beastie indeed now we we move on to 1984 um and jumping straight into the studio pretty much the week after the recording of the final cut had been completed uh roger waters gave us the pros and cons of hitchhiking with its sexist cover that has not aged particularly well uh i don't know what as i've kind of mentioned previously this alongside the wall does not do any great favors in terms of trying to to portray uh, an enlightened attitude. Um, we've got Katie Kassoon on backing vocals for this, um, who sang with live, uh, sang at Live Eight. Uh, we've got um, Andy Bowen on Hammond organ, who again played keyboards on the Final Cut album. Andy Newmark on drums. He played on the Final Cut album too. Uh, I think David Sanborn on fat saxophone played on the Final Cut album, and Roger Waters, who hadn't yet split with himself. Uh, who also played on the Final Cut album. Um, this is basically Pink Floyd without, with, with none of the members of Pink Floyd still in there. As you can see, the cover's water damaged, um, but <laughs> this did cost me about two pounds, so I wasn't going to complain, and you uh, you don't listen with your eyes anyway. Um, it's a 45-minute-ish single suite of interconnected songs which are relating to a very strange and unusual dream which the narrator has uh, which includes being kidnapped with Arabs uh, by Arabs I think uh, I use those words advisedly because I think they're in the lyrics sheet and it's it sounds like Pink Floyd B-sides is what it sounds like it sounds like Pink Floyd B-sides from the 1978 era uh, because that's exactly what it is uh, Roger brought this and the wall to the band and the band thought that the wall uh, was better and had more commercial potential and they were right uh, because uh, Roger then went on a tour which didn't go spectacularly well um, the next solo album is is by Nick Mason and uh, I think Roger Fenn I think is his name uh, I probably should have checked this before. Uh, it's called Fictitious Sports. You will have seen the single previously, Lie for a Lie, which has guest vocals by David Gilmore. Um, most of it is, is fairly fair to middling, instrumental, rockish type stuff uh, that doesn't really leap out at you. 
I've never felt any great need to go back and revisit these songs. Uh, apart from Lie for a Lie, which is really good, uh, it's mostly crap. Uh, sorry, Nick, but I'm sure you agree with me. Um, right, next up, David Gilmore's second solo album. This is called About Face. It was recorded in 1984. Uh, it features um, Jeff Picaro, who also appeared on A Moment Relapse of Reason. Uh, it features Pino Pal Palladino on bass, um, the the best set, or more correctly, one of the most prolific session bass players uh, that there is, um, alongside Bob Ezrin on keyboards, John Lord, I think he was in Yes on synthesizer. Um, oh my God, what a what a proggy album uh, that that is! But the cover is not proggy at all. Um, it looks like a standard rock album. David's trying to do something a little bit more commercial, a little bit more accessible, uh, a little bit more straightforward with this record than um, perhaps some of the some of the stuff that that uh, Pink Floyd were doing. Again, it was issued on CD in two thousand and six uh, in a fairly faithful kind of reproduction of the album. Uh, him looking very young there indeed, or very young by his standards. In my mind, David Gilmore's always been old, if that makes sense. Uh, there are a couple of singles. That released from from this album uh this is one of them love is in the air pete townsend wrote the vocal uh, wrote, wrote the lyrics uh it's backed with let's get Mis metaphysical which could have been a pink floyd song um the album itself ends on a song called near the end which again could have been a pink floyd song um so you can take the guy out of pink floyd but you can't take the pink floyd out of the guy i think is the, the this is a, a 12 inch single of blue lights um which features a 12-inch remix and an instrumental version remixed by Francis Korvakian. I think the words Pink Floyd and dance mixes should never go together, and this is further proof that I am right in that, that respect. Um, now, at that point, that's 1984. Uh, Roger still hasn't left the band. Uh, and at this point, Roger's doing a solo tour uh, and performing the pros and cons of Hitchhiking Live with Eric Clapton on guitar. Um, and he's performing, you know, the first hour and a quarter is Pink Floyd material. Then there's 45 or so minutes of the pros and cons of hitchhiking in full, uh, followed by an encore of brain damage and eclipse from Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, this this bootleg was recorded in New York in 1985. It's everything that Pink Floyd could have been and everything, thank God, Pink Floyd burns. Um, it's interesting, but it's not amazing at all. Uh, also, around about this time, early 1985, David Gilmore released this. Uh, this is the this is a, a, a DVD edition from Brazil. Uh, David Gilmore live at the Hammersmith Odeon. Uh, Nick Mason plays drums on Comfortably Numb uh, on this one, and uh, Roy Harper sings on Short and Sweet. Uh, it features uh, Chris Slade on drums for the rest of the set. Now, uh, Chris is relatively local to where I live. Sometimes see him in town, but not so much these days. Um, there's also a couple of bootlegs of of from the, from the tour. It's not amazing, you know. If you if you're thinking, God, I haven't heard a Pink Floyd thing for a while. I really should hear a Pink Floyd thing. That's where you want to go. Go for the solo albums, and then go back in time as you go along. Because I get the feeling that, that David was writing some songs and thinking, that's going to be a Pink Floyd song. That one uh, should be a solo song. And sometimes there's a you know, specific difference between them. Uh, not to let the grass grow under his feet. Uh, Roger Waters, whilst he was busy leaving the band and threatening with suing everybody and everything forever, even thinking of the words Pink Floyd, uh, contributed aside to the soundtrack album of When the Wind Blows. Um, it's Got, I think, two vocal songs on it, one of which is called, I think, Towers of Faith. The other one is called Folded Flags. They're very, very good songs, um, but they're not uh, they're not easy to find. Um, the film is de incredibly depressing. If you like watching two cartoon people uh, die of radioactive poisoning following an apocalypse-level nuclear explosion while they hide in a bunker, um, then sure, this is exactly the thing for you. If you don't want to be miserable as hell and don't want to to watch basically Grave of the Fireflies uh, set in Runcorn, then this is not the film for you. Um, 
1987 uh, became quite interesting, actually, um, for a number of reasons. It was a very busy year for Roger Waters, a very busy year for Pink Floyd, uh, quite busy for Nick Mason, who released his third and to date final solo album, which is the soundtrack to a film called uh, White of an Eye or White of the Eye. I have no recollection whatsoever of listening to this. Um, so I can't comment on it. Now, these were collected together. These three Nick Mason albums were collected together in a box set called Unattended Luggage. It's a very thin box set. It cost about £15. Um, certainly don't pay much more than that for it. 1987 also saw, um, for the first time, uh, a Sid Barrett bootleg, which the uh, outtake from the recording sessions has started to become much better known starting to circulate amongst the fan base uh, and you can see why some of those songs hadn't been released um, and 1987 also saw the release of uh, Roger Waters uh, Radio Chaos album um, good god this is so 80s it, it makes a momentary lapse of reason look like a work of deathless genius um, it's got horns it's got saxophones it's got programmed drums it's probably got moustaches in it it's probably got I don't know, saxophone solos, it's incredibly dated, um, and it's it's very, very, very much of its time, and its time is a very long time ago. Um, it's got some good songs on it, it's got some bad songs on it, it's got more bad songs than good songs on it, if I'm honest. Um, it's not particularly great at all, um, and at the time, Roger was, was touring uh, in America, as I kind of mentioned in a, a previous kind of light, he, he was touring America um, and playing arenas. Uh, this is a bootleg from Canada. Um, and the arenas, were, he was maybe selling two, 3,000 tickets in a 15, 20,000 seater arena uh, because three or four weeks before or three or four weeks after, Pink Floyd were playing there two, three nights, uh, selling far more tickets than, than Roger was. And I think that really, really hurt Roger's self-confidence and his career. Um, and it affected his ability to to see clearly you know uh, he became very very angry in interviews around Pink Floyd and he described Pink Floyd as uh, you know a forgery and a fraud that has been perpetrated on the public where we heard that phrase before uh, and a number of other things which perhaps um, in retrospect he he now says he was completely wrong for that you know at the time that that Pink Floyd were, were touring across the uh, the US on the uh, Delicate Sound of Thunder tour, for example. Um, they were touring with uh, having lawyers that were touring with them so that if they were served a writ at any of the venues for the cease and desist for unfairly using the Pink Floyd name, um, then they were able to at least um, stop that from taking effect and that they could actually go and perform the show. Staggeringly expensive, uh, and as anyone who has gone to law especially in the music business, will tell you um, the only people that win are the lawyers. Um, Andy Rourke, I think, advised Mike Joyce and said, uh, or I think, no, I think he said to Lol Tolhurst of The Cure, actually, that going to law was the, the most stressful and traumatic thing that he'd ever done, which, considering he'd been in a band with Morrissey for five years, is, is quite something. So, 1987, Roger, putting it technically, uh, died flat on his ass commercially and in terms of sales. Um, didn't do very well at all and uh, really really kind of derailed his solo career um, and as, as a result of that um, Roger came to an agreement with Pink Floyd in December 1987 the agreement being is that Pink Floyd could continue to record and perform without legal intervention from Roger under the name of Pink Floyd as long as they respected the parts of Pink Floyd that Roger had brought to them um, so, for example, in Delicate Sound of Thunder, um, what you will see is that the, uh, there's some pigs which are in the stage show. Uh, these pigs have testicles uh, because the pigs that, that were used by uh, Pink Floyd and Roger Waters was in the band didn't have testicles. Um, and, for example, there's a credit on Delicate Sound of Thunder that says original pig concept by R. Waters. Uh, so that seemed fair um, or if not fair, then at least it was legal. Um, one of the other things, as as part of, of leaving Pink Floyd, um, is that Pink Floyd agreed not to, to stage a performance of The Wall, 
uh, I'm wearing the T-shirt for the wall here uh, because Roger Waters was, was so closely invested in that that he felt that it was only right that only he could put, put uh, the wall on as a solo act. And in 1990, um, Roger played the wall in sequence in full at Berlin uh, in the square that crosses between where East and West were divided. I think it was Potsdamer Platz. Um, I've been there and it looks nothing like it did then. So it's all had buildings and skyscrapers and things like that. And it's not too far away from where Hansa Studios is. Um, and, and the wall in Berlin is really bad. Um, it's, you know, he's made his best efforts to try and make it not terrible. It's got guest appearances by Brian Adams, the Scorpions, Van Morrison, it, Thomas Dolby, I think Tim Curry. It's awful, stodgy, bloated arena stadium prog rock in which a millionaire moans about how he misses his dad and how his teachers were awful and how he built up the walls around himself uh, and somehow you know the sheer chutzpah and the tone deaf honking arrogance to think that Berlin having very recently taken down the Berlin Wall and having unified after having been divided would appreciate having a free concert by a former member of Pink Floyd uh, talking about how the Germans had killed his father and therefore had ruined his life and the teachers and so on and yada 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 boring 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 it's awful this is the worst uh, Roger Waters release that there is and it's not even the correct show because the power failed halfway through mother um and uh, there's a you can see it on youtube um you know roger quite literally sinks to his knees and starts praying on national television because all the power has failed um and uh, they then went and did did the show again to an empty platz about two o'clock in the morning um to make sure that the filming was correct so the, the version that's on the dvd of the wall life in berlin is significantly different it's a restaging the next morning about two o'clock in the morning with the original cast to make sure that the home release of it didn't look awful but the problem is the wall live in berlin is terrible um any record that's got the scorpions on is almost irredeemable it's then got van morrison and uh, brian adams and if we look through the cast list that are on here um I mean, it's got Paul Carrick on it, Jerry Hall, the Hooters, Cindy Lauper, uh, Joni Mitchell, Sinead O'Connor. Uh, Sinead O'Connor lost her place in the middle of Mother because she couldn't hear correctly. So the version of Mother on there is a re-recording. Uh, I mean, she sings wonderfully, but it's not good. And it's, it's just really, really bad. Uh, please um, avoid The Wall live in Berlin if you can. Now, The Wall in Berlin brings up a couple of unusual releases, uh, which I'm going to bring on here. Uh, this is a promotional CD for The Wall, live in Berlin. Um, it featured, for, at the time, the very first release of When the Tigers Broke Free on CD. It's a different mix to the version that's on the Echoes compilation and was later inserted into the final cut. It also features a new studio recording of another brick in the wall, which is not available anywhere else. And that new studio recording, you can find it on YouTube. Again, it's not very good. Um, I think Roger wanted to build up his ego again after the, you know, the commercial failure of um, the Radio Chaos tour. And it didn't quite work. He also released the single of Another Brick in the Wall, but he didn't release the new studio version he re-recorded of Another Brick in the Wall. He released a live version of it, um, which is, again, not amazing. I'm going to be very polite about it. It's also backed with a truly unforgettable uh, 1990-era dance mix of Run Like Hell that has been re-recorded by him and his solo band. It's... Again, it's bad. It really is. If you think the best thing to happen to run like hell is to stick a 1990 drum machine over the top and some wiggles and some squiggles and some boops and beeps, um, we need to talk. It's awful. And uh, I'm very glad that I didn't spend a significant amount of money on it. Now, around this time, Roger, uh, Roger Waters was you know, busy destroying his career. Um, 
and it, it becoming like the haunted ghost of Pink Floyd uh, standing at the background yelling at people. Um, we also had the third and to date final Sid Barrett album, which is called Opal. This is a collection of studio recordings, outtakes and songs that he wrote for the two albums in 1970 and 71, but didn't make it on there. So there's, for example, Opal, Rats, uh, Dolly Rocker, Word Song, Wines and Dines. These aren't amazing songs, by the way, that they're, they're interesting. Um, and there's a couple of alternate takes. Um, there's also Dark Globe is on here, which is probably his best song as a solo artist. Um, and there's also an alternate version of Golden Hair. Um, two alternate versions, actually. Um, this was released because of the rise in the number of bootlegs which had come out, which featured circulating tapes of, of Sid um, recording. Not that it stopped anyone from carrying on, because the next, next stop that we had was 1992 uh, with uh, Roger Waters uh, releasing an album called Amused to Death. Now, this album is easily the best thing Roger Waters uh, has released since leaving Pink Floyd. This is the original 1992 release. It has a different cover of a monkey watching a television. Um, the original uh, name for some of the songs uh, there's what there's a song called what god wants on there which is a list song and roger was is very very good at list songs where he largely lists things that rhyme together so uh you know he's got a section in not now john where he goes you know can't stop lose job get away make hay etc and it's all like that all the way through and what what god wants is uh very very similar in its lyrical style you can clearly tell that it's the guy from pink floyd but not actually in Pink Floyd, if that makes sense. So, you know, you open the, the lyric book that we've got on this, and uh, What God Wants, Part 1, has lyrics like, God wants borders, God wants crack, God wants rainfall, God wants wetbacks, God wants voodoo, God wants shrines, God wants law, God wants organised crime, and it's all just, just a list of things that rhyme together. Uh, but there's almost like a combined, commemorative effect of a torrent of words. Now, where Roger Waters is particularly good is in, in his use of language, in his use of time, and his ability to say now, as opposed to his ability to master melody. Um, it, this is probably the best album that he's made since leaving Pink Floyd. Uh, not that there is much competition, because I think there's only four of them. Um, it has uh, a couple of other great songs on it. It has Perfect Sense. It has the bravery of being out of range. Uh, it's got It's a Miracle, uh, which is wonderfully cutting about Andrew Lloyd Webber and Amused to Death. The album was inspired by uh, a book, which I think is called Amused to Death, um, which was around how the human race had amused itself to death because it was so busy being entertained by what was on television and in the media that it had forgotten to take notice of what was actually going on in the real world outside it. Um, and that humans being merely evolved animals. Um, it, it was, uh, for example, the original version of what got once was called Monkey TV. Pretty on the nose there, Roger. Listening to a Roger Water album is sometimes like hanging out with Oliver Stone telling you about war. war. The only thing that you don't have is that kind of sense of being punched in the face by someone really obviously going, dude, war is wrong. I'm like, yeah, I know war is wrong. But Oliver Stone does that when he did Platoon, when he did Salvador. It's the same kind of ham-fisted, king of the obvious approach. Luckily, it's not quite so obvious on, on Amused to Death. Um, now, Amused to Death sounds an awful lot like Pink Floyd. And the uh, the guy that was in charge of Columbia Records, who uh, Roger had his solo deal with, said if this had the name Pink Floyd on it, it would have sold 10 million copies. It sold about 500,000. And Roger Waters, having been burnt by the, the last time um, that he toured to empty arenas, had said he would tour if the album sold a million. The album sold 500,000, so he didn't tour. And Roger Waters went into a brief, well, relatively brief, uh, early retirement, uh, while he angrily dismissed the existence of the, the remaining members of Pink Floyd. Uh, kind of like, you know, if you have an ex-wife who's absolutely furious that you, you meet somebody new, but at the same point doesn't want to have anything to do with you. Uh, and I think it's fair to say the divorce between uh, Roger and Pink Floyd was perhaps one of the most acrimonious uh, musical divorces that there was. Now, in 2015, uh, Amused to Death was reissued. And, and this is a double album picture disc edition of the record. Uh, it was reissued, it was remixed, uh, it was built up from the, the remaining multi-tracks uh, and, and re-put together 
um, it's got some different sound effects on it so on one of the tracks perfect sense for example um, there is a speech from hal 9000 in space oddity uh, my mind is going dave stop it i can feel it on the uh, original album here uh, the, the original version of amused to death that speech is reversed and when you play it backwards um, there is a coded message to stanley kubrick i cannot remember what it is but it's not complimentary. Now, the original cover of Amused to Death was meant to be three people in a wine glass drowning, which was a, a savage kind of indictment of how Roger saw Pink Floyd had, had prostituted his band to uh, just basically drink a lot of wine and become very, very rich on the back of his work. Uh, but then Roger, you know, sat at home, uh, scowled at the band and cashed the checks. So uh, he kind of complained, that much all things considered because he was then able to take seven years off work uh, whilst he went around buying art selling off art cells uh, and things things of that nature um so i'm going to draw to a close in in two two releases time uh, and then we're going to pick up with the year 2000 after that um 1996 saw saw the release of this which is broken china which is the second solo album and the last one by rick wright now when when Rick was, was writing uh, songs which went on to become part of the Division Bell, uh, he scored all of his songs 10 out of 10. Um, and and the, the other members, so the three members of the band sat in the room together, they listened to the songs and they marked the songs. Every time that one of Rick's came up, he gave it 10 out of 10. Uh, and after a while, uh, I think David and Nick went, um, Rick, all of your songs are getting 10 out of 10 and our songs aren't. And he was like, yeah, you didn't tell me I couldn't score my songs 10 out of 10, did you? Uh, so some of those songs which he wrote, which he was very, very passionate about, um, were, were kind of you know, relegated off once they said, Rick, you can't score your songs 10 out of 10. That's not fair. Um, and so uh, in, fact, in effect, I mean, Broken China is kind of like a sequel to parts of the Division Bell. It's got a very similar approach. Um, there's some songs on here that would definitely have fitted just right into a Pink Floyd album. Um, there's guest vocals from Sinead O'Connor. Um, there's guitar from, I think, Tim Renwick, who was part of Pink Floyd's live band in 1994. Uh, David Gilmore wrote a solo for the song Breakthrough, but he didn't, uh, but it wasn't used on the final version of the album. Um, we've got Pino Palladio on bass, or Palladino, who played on About Face. Um, Anthony Moore, who co-wrote some of the lyrics uh, on um, A Momentary Lapse of Reason, uh, also wrote some of the lyrics for this album, but also did some of the programming and arrangements. Um, and, and there's a song called, called Breakthrough on here, which is absolutely fantastic and um, will appear later on. But again, as I said, um, you know, could have very easily sat into the Pink Floyd uh, collection of work. It all went very, very quiet at that point. Um, I think there was the expectation that Pink Floyd would start again and they would, they would continue to make music, but they didn't. Um, and there was, I think, some doubt around, you know, where, where, whether Pink Floyd reached the end or whether there was anything else for the, for the band to do. Um, that changed. So in, in 1999 through to 2002, uh, Roger Waters um, went out on a solo tour without an album that went with it. He billed himself as, I think, the creative genius and songwriter of Pink Floyd because modesty has always been Roger Waters' strong point. Um, and he played a show with um, that was very reminiscent of, of him almost reclaiming his, his legacy and his membership of Pink Floyd. You know, he spent a long time with his face pressed up against the glass outside of the the, the, the whale of, of Pink Floyd, kind of like, you know, as, as the, the angry, bitter ex-wife who missed out on the lottery win. Um, and I got the impression that he wanted that back. So he started out touring in 1999. Uh, in, in arenas in America, uh, tickets were priced at $35 uh, because he'd been bitten 12 years previously by playing to empty arenas, uh, and he didn't want that to happen again. And, the, yeah, Pink Floyd hadn't toured for five years. There was no real grasp of whether anybody was even interested in solo Pink Floyd tours, let alone whether anybody was, was interested in a, a Roger Waters tour. Um, so he played upon the imagery that went with being a member of Pink Floyd, and... Uh, for example, um, although I'm jumping ahead in the chronology a little bit, you know, uh, 
that's the the kind of, of if imagery that he had on his posters you know he had these album covers and he had a pig pig made out of walls um and he used things which he could that so for example we've got here we've got the moon which is in the eclipse we've got the barbed wire that goes with the wall we've got on the back here we've got the pros and cons of hitchhiking you know the whole thing was very clearly reminiscent of but not quite pink floyd and roger was uh touring on the grounds of letting people know that uh, Mr. Pink Floyd was, was still Mr. Pink Floyd. Um, the tour sold out pretty quickly. Uh, his, his band included Snowy White, who'd been in the, the 1977 to 1982 version of Pink Floyd, and John Carrion on keyboards, who'd been in the 1987 to 1994 touring version of Pink Floyd. Um, he also had Graham Broad on drums, who played with him at, at the Wall in Berlin, and Andy Fairweather Lowe, who was a guitarist who'd, who'd played, I think, on some David Gilmore albums as well. Um, when Roger rang John Karin and said, uh, I want you to do a tour, John was very much along the lines of that. I just need to make a call. And, and you know, um, John rang David Gilmore and said, I've been asked by David Gilmore if I would play on Roger's solo tour. And uh, David said, uh, of course, you must do it. He is brilliant. Um, so, you know, if you can't get the actual Rick Wright, then at least you can get Rick Wright's stunt double, John Carrion. Uh, sorry to talk about you in such a term, John, but, uh, you know, you were brought in to replicate Rick's feel and sound, and I think that was successful. This is a really good release, um, although by the limitations of DVD technology, it's perhaps not quite as, as good as we might be expecting because it was recorded over 20 years ago in, in New Jersey. Um, the set is almost exclusively Pink Floyd material, apart from, I think, the middle 20 minutes where he plays four songs from Amused to Death and one song from The Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking alongside a new song, Each Small Candle, which hasn't been released anywhere else. Uh, this is the, the first of the, the major Pink Floyd releases uh, alongside uh, Broken, Broken China, uh, which hasn't been released on vinyl. Um, so the, these two releases are not available on vinyl. If you are collecting Pink Floyd vinyl, you won't find these. If you do, they're unofficial releases. And that brings us up to uh, the end of the 90s, the first 30 years of the Pink Floyd solo experience um, with uh, solo releases by Sid Barrett, by David Gilmour, by Roger Waters, by Rick Wright, and uh, less successfully commercially and artistically ones by Nick Mason. Um, this is uh, the end of, I think, part one of episode 14. I'm going to pick up the year 2000 and onwards for the solo Pink Floyd releases in a couple of minutes. Thank you very much. See you soon.